Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Barnes Takeout. My name is Amy Gillette, and I'm a collections researcher. Today, um, I'm delighted to be talking with you about this painting. It's entitled Two Mysterious Cabins, painted in about 1934 by the Italian artist Giorgio de Chirico. And just to get this out of the way, you may be looking at the painting and saying to yourself, I see three cabins. And I happen to have a copy of the original catalog card right here in front of me. And its original title when it came to the Barnes in 1937 was Mysterious Bathers. So, you know, to answer that question. And now with that said, let's head on into the Barnes and look at where it is in the foundation. Look a bit at the artist and then think some more about the painting. So here it is um, upstairs in a little corner room in room number 22, um, right here on the west wall. And this is really one of my favorite rooms. I think it does a great job of bringing together um, African, West African sculpture that Barnes had seriously collected mostly in the middle of the 1920s. Um, a lot of metalwork, uh, especially in the middle of the 1930s, as he, especially as he was working with the philosopher, his friend John Dewey, on a book called Art as Experience that really is all about how you're supposed to um, engage with works of art at the Barnes Foundation in what was really a democratic way. And then many, um, many paintings that are really quite late for the foundation, um, late 1940s for this um, figure of St. Martin by Afro, a sculpture by um, his brother Mirko down here, um, late work by Paul Clay over here. And then thematically, let's zoom in just a little bit because um, I, when I look at this particular wall at the Barnes, I see a couple of themes that to me emerge and that the two mysterious cabins participates in. So on one level, kind of in these, on the lower level, we've got sort of iterations of solitary figures, the St. Martin, Women at Table by, um, by Bonar, by Matisse. We have um, a New Mexican figure of St. Michael the Archangel down here. We've got um, the standing figurines and the masks by West African sculptors in the vitrine. And then above, um, these paintings that engage with architectural themes like um, Paul Clay's Village Among Rocks, The Mysterious Cabins, a scene of Acrocorinth also in Greece by Alexei Grichenko up here. And then, um, architectural ironwork immediately above the cabins um, that may in its triangular shape seems to echo the pediments of the cabins that we see down here. So we might be bringing these themes into our reading into our reading of the painting, but let's just take a peek first at Giorgio de Chirico. So here he is only a couple of years after he painted the mysterious cabins, painted it in 1934, um, displayed it in Rome in 35, and then in 1936 to 38, he was actually living in America in New York and visited the Barnes Foundation. And here looks, um, I think, faintly amused to be surrounded by all this Americana. And then in the ensuing years, two self-portraits that he painted of himself, um, kind of the left over here, we've got him looking like a Roman senator, um, nude except for his drapery. Here he's kind of playing with the Roman um, artistic idea of verism or truth to life, where in the case of the senator, you see, say, the face is not idealized, but betraying that the man, the man's age, that he's old enough and wise enough to be um, ruling wisely and justly. Um, and, you know, likewise, Kiriko's no young heroic man over here either. And then on the right hand side, we have him looking like a Baroque portrait done by Velasquez of the Spanish king. So he's treating history almost as like a series of costumes that he can take on and off um, with a smile on his face, but really showing us his um, truly deep and discursive engagement with um, history and art history that he does, I believe, bring to the mysterious cabins and mysterious bathing scene. Um, I'm just going to put on my, um, <laughs> my noisemaker over here. And as for the mysterious cabins, um, de Chirico was a mysterious artist, but um, these, as funny and wonderfully strange as they look, have an unusually straightforward explanation to them, actually. And I brought to you here a retrospective quote um, given by Georgia de Chirico in the year 1973. 
Um, he's saying the idea for the mysterious baths came to me once when I happened to be in a house where the wooden parquet floor had been polished with wax. I watched a gentleman walking in front of me whose legs reflected in the floor. I had the impression that he could sink into that floor like in a swimming pool and that he could move and even swim in it. Then I imagined strange swimming pools with men immersed in a kind of water parquet who stood still and moved and at times stopped moving to converse with other men who stood outside of the swimming pool. So there we go. We've got the water parquet, the brown zigzaggy water. We have men immersed in it. It does look like this guy over here, who's kind of gripping the ledge right there, is about to try and converse with this kind of heroic, colossal, suited figure of a man gazing out into the distance um, against these hazy mountains that might have been the mountains of, of Greece um, against this um, wonderful, what Barnes said was a Renoir sky in which these um, these flags are kind of standing like still and in suspense. So and then um, to kind of get to other aspects of the mysterious baths, a lot of this was rooted in Georgia de Chirico's childhood in Volos, Greece. And um, Volos was a much mythologized city, by the way. It was um, the city where the Argonauts, the myth of the Argonauts of Jason and the Golden Fleece took place. Um, it was also ne very near Mount Pelion, um, the home of, um, of a famous centaur. Um, it was near the site of the myth of Leda and the Swan. And so we've got childhood memories kind of brought together with mythology, I should say straight away. On the left hand side, um, we've got this vintage postcard that you can see is um, a volos um, it's printed here in um, in Greek and also then in Latin letters. Um, his uh, George de Chirico's dad, um, Avarista de Chirico, was in charge of um, the firm Thessaly Railways and actually connected Volos to Mount Pleon, um, the centaur's home, as well as to Athens, and connected the city of Volos itself um, to the seashore. And the railway firm had um, at the newly accessible seashore this series of cabins built, changing cabins where you could go into an individual one, take your clothes off, and then from inside the cabin enter the water by means of these ladders. And as a little boy, De Kiriko was just fascinated by their transformative aspect where you could have a person kind of looking modern and vulnerable, a man very much stamped with your time, wearing whatever fashion was fashionable then. And then you'd um, emerge on these ladders into this um, literally naked kind of primordial humanity. And not only that, but De Kiriko was kind of horrified at the ladders, how you could see down just a few feet until they disappeared into the oceanic abyss. Um, maybe some of you recognize that kind of similar horror of, of deep water. And then um, there were also swans kind of nearby that had come from the Anavros River. And so we're bringing together um, the sights, the memories, um, De Kiriko's impressions. He was also, his interest was super piqued by the way in which these cabins um, seem to resemble masks, um, almost like the, um, the West African masks that you can see them set up next to at the barns where they, um, by masking, seem to disclose something metaphysical or mysterious um, about humanity, where when you go into them, as when you put on a mask, there's something transformational and you maybe um, kind of unveil instead some sort of higher or deeper truth about human humanity or human experience. And um, and for that, it seems to be going into the mythology mythologization of man and the sort of conversations between mythical and modern man, um, which are themes that de Kirko seems to be drawing out in these mysterious baths. And it was indeed um, quite a long series. It started um, one year earlier in 1934 with a series of 10 lithographs that de Chirico had made to accompany poems called Mythology by his um, friend Jean Cocteau. And um, as a matter of fact, we don't see it here, but in other lithographs, you see like leaping centaurs, like those that live in, on Mount Pouillon next to the mysterious water. But also going deeper, um, 
connecting this kind of Greek mythology with um, dinosaur history. And let's look back at this image over here of um, the swan. Note how close the plesiosaur from Dakirako's favorite childhood book, The World Before the Flood, getting deeper into that oceanic history and oceanic abyss that he was kind of talking about when he talked about his fear and horror of, um, of the ladder going down into the water. And, um, and so he kept repeating these theories, um, these theories, these series, to try and I think get at um, more of a fleshing out of the conversations between myth, um, between deep history and the experience of modern man. We see, um, this is kind of splendid, an image of 1936. It's called Mysterious Baths, Manhattan where he believed that these um, skyscrapers of Manhattan really took on the same mysterious aspects. Um, their kind of ability to both veil and unveil, as we saw with the cabins, that he amalgamates too with his arch architectural motifs from other paintings, like the, um, the curtain sanctuaries of temples that we can see over here and over here. Um, that we can also see at other paintings at the Barnes Foundation, like the Arrival or the Red Tower that he painted in the teens. And these resolved. Um, oh, oh, so before we get to that, actually, um, one more thing that I'd like to think about. So as he's working through these series, I wanted to touch briefly on this idea of repetition but before we get to the finale. So here's um, here's a quote that I thought was incredibly useful um, by Emily Braun in a 1996 um, book or exhibition catalog called The Kiriko in America. She wrote, in the famous critic Clement Greenberg's terms, the avant-garde moves while Alexandrianism, or what was believed to be this kind of decadent period of, um, of Greek or Hellenistic art stood still. But de Chirico rejected the modernist strive to supersede in favor of kind of a pre-postmodernist deepening that arrests time and a continuous back and forth of associations, citations, and repetitions. If you want to remember him being a Roman senator or being a Spanish Baroque king. Inspired by Friedrich Nietzsche's notion of the eternal return, de Chirico conceived of his art as an endless recycling of motifs, themes, and styles. He also adopted Nietzsche's perception of modernity as the age of comparison, wherein all styles, civilizations, morals, and habits can be seen side by side and are available to the common man and aristocrat alike. And so I think, first of all, this um, this leveling of the fine, um, of the high, with the sort of quotidian, everyday, the popular, is so perfect, um, both for de Chirico and for the Barnes Foundation. This is exactly what Barnes at the time was really trying to flesh out and bring to our experience with John Dewey. Um, but with this idea of re um, re repetition and the repetition of motifs, I think that here's a wonderful way to look at it finally, where this is um, this is an installation done in Milan in 1973. This was actually the occasion of the quote about the water parquet that I read, um, that we looked at a little bit earlier together. Um, and we see this like triumphal resolution of these series of paintings in the mysterious baths fountain where we have um, real water, it's immersive, it's a real um, swimming pool and people have used it as such with the cabin, um, with the swimmers where we've got the actual water and the um, sculpted three-dimensional water. Um, I love this guy doing freestyle over here. And then we see um, the so-called metaphysical source of the water over here with its painted zigzags kind of coursing down into the stream. And I think what Kiriko really was getting at, at this is um, the water was basically a site of that an idea quoted from the Greek philosopher Heraclitus that everything flows, that everything is cyclical, but kind of as the motif of the mysterious baths paints again a little bit differently in every iteration, that adds just a bit um, to the kind of mythology of man, um, the kind of metaphysical meanings that 
you make for yourselves out of your experiences and your memories. And in the same way, I think that you get the same experience at the Barnes Foundation every time um, you bring yourself to paintings like the two mysterious cabins. Here we'll look at it again. Um, it's just a teeny bit different for you. And so plenty to think about with these wonderful mysterious images, plenty of mystery to discover. And um, I should note, by the way, that I'll be teaching a course on Dekirico in April that anyone's welcome to sign up for. And um, and so that is it for today's takeout. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tom Collins, Newbauer Family Executive Director of the Barnes Foundation. I hope you enjoyed Barnes Takeout. Subscribe and make sure your post notifications are on to get daily servings of art. Thanks for watching and for your support of the Barnes Foundation.